All right, is my microphone working now? I see there's one viewer, so uh, hopefully you're able to type something into the chat and let me know if you can hear me. It looks like I have managed to successfully run Streamlabs this week, and I can see that the volume on my microphone is registering, so it seems like it's probably broadcasting. Um, and I'm also on a bit of a delay because I am successfully using Streamlabs this week. So um, I may not respond immediately to things that pop up in the chat, but this is a much better setup than streaming just straight up on YouTube because I can see that there, how many viewers I have and I can see that uh, I can read what's in the chat because I'm able to pump up the size of the text here, bad eyesight, recall. Um, so yay, I'm very excited. Welcome to my third Open Studio stream. I'm Rachel Pollock. I am the costume craftsperson at Playmakers Repertory Company in normal times. These are pandemic times and we're uh, running a virtual season, streamed shows and live readings, and there's not as much call for people like myself to build costumes for actors who are not performing on stage. Uh, they need far less costumes when they're just performing in this little Zoom box. So I'm also a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and I teach this semester, I'm teaching millinery class, which ordinarily my students would be in class with me or other professors. Our class time is in the morning between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. And in the afternoon is when we work on the, sh the costume production for the professional company. So ordinarily, being in my millinery class would mean you'd attend class in the mornings and in the afternoons, you would have your list of responsibilities that you are working on for the show that is currently on deck for production. But I would have my list of responsibilities, and that would include, most often, there are hats. There are hats in most of the shows that we do, even contemporary shows. Um, and, and my millinery students would be able to observe me working in the studio. And they'd see, for example, a, a set of costume designs come in, and that designer has rendered uh, certain characters with certain hats on them in the drawing. And my students would just learn by virtue of being in the space with me, working alongside me on this bigger project. They'd see the rendering, the research. Then they'd see me create a mock-up, fit it on the performer, cut it out in the real or block it out in the real material that the designer had chosen. So they'd see it go from a conceptual design to an actual object to be worn. And this studio stream provides me with the opportunity, uh, gives me the opportunity to provide that to my students where they can see hats become into existence as I'm working on them. So recollect, uh, if you're new to the stream, um, if this is your first time visiting with me in my open stream, um, to recap, I'm not making shows for the stage right now, but I am, I'm not making hats for the stage right now, but I am making hats for, um, this one here is, is part of a, a donation of hats that I'm um, supplying to a local nonprofit who is hosting a charity auction this year as a means of fundraising. Um, and I also am working on a hat for inclusion in a uh, art exhibition, an online art exhibition that's being hosted by the classical station WCPE 98.7, which that sounds like I'm plugging them or something. They're just a radio station here in, um, in North Carolina that streams and broadcasts classical music. I like classical music. It, you know, they, they d announced this art exhibit and um, said that they would welcome a hat as a submission to it, so I'm making one. Um, and that's what I guess uh, we're going to look at today. If, if you watched the stream last time, I mentioned this charity auction that I'm making hats for, and that they were, they asked me for two hats, a winter hat and a summer hat. And I showed this 
last time, and actually probably the first uh, open studio as well, that I've completed this hat. You can't see it well because I'm wearing a dark colored shirt and this is a dark colored felt hat. But if you see, it is um, a blocked felt cloche shape basically and it has these handmade, hand felted red poppies on it. And this one, it's got my label there in the back. This one, I'm done with it. Like I can hand this off to them and it's ready to go. If you love this hat, check out the charity auction for Crepe Myrtle Festival because it's going to be sold there. Um, but I, I was very undecided in the last, um, in the last stream as to what to do for my straw hat, which my summer hat, which is going to be blocked straw. And we had two styles that we looked at. Um, there was this silver straw asymmetrical top hat here and there was a, a smaller green straw fedora-esque miniature hat um, that, that I was entertaining as another possibility because um, I, I'm, I'm not typically someone who hey Denise oh my god yay welcome I'm not typically, and thank you for that compliment on my poppy hat. Um, I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out. And I still have a string of like 10 other poppies. So that whole concept can, can reprise in future winter hats as well. Um, but I, I mentioned that I'm not particularly um, practiced at designing a hat from absolute scratch you know as a theatrical milliner normally i will have uh, a costume designer provide me with at the very least a rendering with a drawing of the hat that they'd like me to make sometimes i'll get uh, research images uh, photographs or paintings or um, ten types or illustrations of styles similar to that hat or here is a photograph from Godie's ladies book or here's a, an illustration from Godie's ladies book make that hat except in purple and blue or whatever I almost never am in the position to where I can create a hat out of nothing I, I choose the material I choose the style I choose the uh, trimmings and so forth you should be pleased. That'll make some dough for the crepe myrtle folks. Yes, I'm hoping that it does. See, I feel so bad for them. They're a local um, nonprofit that um, they they work on uh, HIV education and support for those diagnosed and so forth. Um, and they normally raise all of their money with this giant festival, which obviously cannot happened this year due to the pandemic so this online auction is their uh, replacement for that so I, I do hope that these hats that I'm donating bring them some money along with all of the other donations that I'm sure that they'll be getting um, but yes to go back to, to designing a hat it's very difficult to for me personally as a theatrical milliner it is difficult to be in a position where I have to choose absolutely every element. I pick the material, I pick the trims, I pick the style. Um, and, you know, normally, even when I'm working with a designer that, that trusts my skill and my aesthetic as a milliner and my aesthetic judgment, um, who, you know, for example, say, uh, the, the designer we've worked together before they know they've been happy with hats I've made for them before and they'll pull me a, a trim collection or what I like to call a trim story of you know here are a bunch of baubles and knickknacks and ribbons and flowers and feathers and just make it look good here's some styles that I like I trust you and 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 I am basically designing that hat but I've been giving a toy box you know a toolbox from which to build it. And um, for these hats that I'm making for the art show and the charity auction, it has really just been completely on me to choose every element of it. And some of it has just been serendipitous, like what do I have lying around that I can 
make a hat from this month. Um, but it has meant that I've done a lot of uh, this technique that I described in my previous streams where I pin out the trim on a hat. You know, I get it to the point where it just needs to be trimmed. I pin out the trim in a certain configuration and I leave it that way on a mannequin for a couple of days for me to really uh, just sort of aesthetically sit with it and absorb it and decide whether I think that's the finished hat or is some other configuration preferable. And so last week we saw this hat with, it started out with, oh, I've got it down here. It started out, trimmed out with this beautiful Celadon uh, scalloped edge ribbon and these roses with sprayed in gold. Um, did you see that? Um, pinned out on here. And I had been looking at that for a couple of days. So what I did in last week's stream was pin out a whole new configuration and live with that for a couple of days. And that involved this vintage black grow grain and this really bizarre, uh, I guess it's a flower, but it's like the center of it is a little spiral of horsehair braid and a rhinestone. And then there's petals made out of different feathers and then there are silk flower petals and and these crazy little stripped rooster feathers shooting out of it this is this is a lot right here <laughs> um aesthetically this is a choice and and so i had trimmed it out but it it and i liked it you know i i of course you know i i designed it i thought it was great but the more i sat and looked at it over the next couple of days i realized that it was it was to my own personal taste, but it was perhaps a little more adventurous than most contemporary hat wearers are willing to embrace. And, and it was also kind of, you know, um, well, monochromatic. You have a gray hat, you have black trim. It, it, it's, it's very black and white and, and, and silent filmy, and that's great. Um, but in thinking about who is most likely to be the bidding uh, populace in this charity auction, I thought I should come up with something that would appeal to a, a, a broader, uh, less, not conservative, but, but not quite as adventurous as the shooting rooster feathers. <laughs> and then I also found this wonderful uh, ribbon here that you see along going along this hat that it's the middle section of it is a double faced satin ribbon and then it's got this um, organza ruffle that's part of the we, it's part of the structure of the ribbon this isn't a one ribbon stitched on top of some ruffles this is the ribbons woven that way um, and it, it matched wonderfully this handmade um, fabric flower from Eminesh Schmalberg, which I went back to the last week's video stream and edited the text on that to include a link to their company in case anybody wants to buy these super amazing handmade um, fabric flowers. And so I've pinned out this trim configuration with the ribbon. It's, you know, it starts under here really, the ribbon comes out of the interior hat band, the interior sweatband, and comes up, rides along where a hat band would go, and then shoots up here at the front into this big flower. Um, and I, this is a case that I, I mentioned last time, that, that trying to force a trim to do something that you want it to do aesthetically when the structure of say the ribbons weave just doesn't want to take the curve that you need it to take um that instead of trying to force it to do something like that um that you should work with the properties of the material as they are and i also didn't want to um i didn't want to stick with the convention of the hat band that fully encircles the join between the crown and the brim like when you think of 
a, a, a masculine fedora and there's there's like a grow grain that goes all the way around the head size uh, or the, the base of the, the crown there. And there's usually like a little, maybe a feather or a little bow. Um, but that's very much a, a restricted belt is what it, it reminds me of. It's very sober. It's very, um, con not conservative, um, but but it's, it's very down to earth. And because of the asymmetricality of the block on which this straw hat was created, um, I felt like I didn't want to, to weigh it down with a belt of a hat band. And this sort of variation of the ribbon spiraling up this asymmetrical crown um, really appealed to me. Plus it's what the ribbon wanted to do. It didn't really want to be a hat band on this thing. So I pinned this out a couple of days ago and, and I'm pretty set on it being um, how I'm going to, I'm gonna stabilize it like this. Um, and, and that may be what I do today in this stream. Um, it's pinned on right now with quilt pins so that I can find their little yellow heads as I uh, stabilize it and remove those pins. And if you look at the crown of the hat, so I've got this Schmalberg blue sparkly rose. Well, not rose. It's, I think it's more of a chrysanthemum, really. Um, fabric flower on the front. And then, so if you could see that ribbon come up at an angle there, and then it, it folds under and there's a tail end of it here coming out the back of the flower. Um, and I liked that the idea of, of um, cockades as ornamentations of hats, the way that you have a, a, the round nature of the cockade, and then there's usually a ribbon or two that shoot off of it. Um, and so being inspired by that, I have not just this ribbon coming out the back of it, but if you look at the crown of the hat, then I've created a couple more here. And then I found <laughs> in my trim stash, I, I found what what I call, or what I've been sort of mentally thinking of as couture pom-poms. Like they're not, they're not like the pom-poms that you buy at Joann's where they're synthetic fuzz. These are hand tied um, from rayon cord. And, but they're, they're fun and they, they fill up this great space in the back of, you know, that flower does not spill over onto the crown, but it didn't, it needed something there. It needed something to surmount that uh, precipice of the crown of the hat and spill over into this little ribbon ornament that's coming out the back. And so I, I found a whole handful of these guys, but I, I put two of them on there. I thought that was kind of cute. Um, it's kind of frivolous and fun. And then there's a, a vintage button in there as well. So this is going to be what this hat is. I am going to stabilize all of this because I've been looking at it for a few days and I've been thinking, if I had some money that I wanted to donate to Crepe Myrtle Festival and I saw this hat, I like this hat, um, and, and I don't feel like it's too much my own personal style. Um, but that brings me to the other hat that, uh, that we're going to talk about today, which is not the green hat. The green hat is on hold for some future purpose. Um, but you may recall in the very first stream, moving it into the view here, I talked about this crazy black and white striped fin of a hat and how I was, I was stabilizing this fin on the cap of the hat and we talked about how to stabilize this flower element. And I realized that, that I didn't want it to just be this pom-pom of a hydrangea on there and then naked black straw over here. So I found, I have pinned out some trim as an idea on that. And this one, I haven't had it pinned out for quite so long. And I, I like what's happening here with this ribbon element in the front. It's, it's sort of uh, it's sort of piratical now almost, like in a weird Tim Burton kind of way, which is totally right up my alley. Um, but if you look at the back side, I, this is what it looked like last week, or the first uh, stream. You could see this base of the straw, spiral straw cap that the fin is mounted on, and I wanted to put some ornamentation there so it's not just like this naked straw sitting here. And so the other thing I'm hoping to do today, 
maybe I'll do it first, um, is to make some ribbon frew like we have on the front and pin it up on the back so I can sort of live with this Tim Burton pirate hat for a couple of days before I nail it all down. And that, you know, in the intervening time since last week's, hey, Kim Fraser, <laughs> good to see you coming to us live from your own open studio, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for the addition, the, your compliment about the, the addition of the ribbon. It, it felt, it felt too, too simple. I mean, it's, it's already a, a pretty ostentatious hat, aesthetically speaking. Um, but, but I felt like it, it needed, I mean, this, this black and white hat that I just had slid out here is not for the charity auction. It does not have to appeal to someone who wants to, you know, donate some money to a charitable cause and, and get a nice piece of art out of it. Um, I, it's, it's just for the art exhibit. So I can exercise my own over the top sort of outre sensibility <laughs> in making it into the Tim Burton pirate hat that I want it to be. And then, I don't know, maybe I'll wear it for Halloween. Like who cares? Um, it's, it's going to become what I would like it to come, become when I have absolutely no one else to consider as the potential future wearer. Whereas this one, I do care about uh, the Crepe Myrtle Festival being able to auction this thing and someone seeing it and thinking, I would wear that to church, which I don't think, well, I don't want to judge the aesthetic tastes of other folks, but it, it, the other one is, is, is more, um, it's just, more singular, <laughs> less a, a broad appeal. Whereas this one, I think, especially with this new trim configuration, um, I think it has a, a broader appeal, uh, especially for folks who might be inclined to wear a hat like this to a wedding, to a, a sporting event, once those happen again, um, to church, you know, once we're able to gather again, if you are inclined to be a hat wearer, I feel more like this has a broader appeal, I suppose. Yes, more goth. The other one is more goth. Let's <laughs> let's just call it what it is. Um, but I will say, to, to go back to this uh, Tim Burton pirate hat situation here, um, the ribbon here is, is worth just pointing out and talking about because it is, um, it's from the Makuba sale that I mentioned a couple of streams ago, I think, uh, Makuba ribbon, which I've since learned that boutique has closed in the garment district. And I was unable to find even a Japanese website for Makuba, so it's possible that the brand doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but this six inch satin ribbon in berry burgundy is one of the things that I purchased at that sale um, and you know there's probably around 20 yard, well there was when I bought it because there's a notation on here that says full spool um, there's 20 yards of it on here and I got it for as I see written on the top here $15 which I know this would have been around $25 a yard had it been retail um, so I'm super excited to use some of this to trim out the rest of this crazy gothic pirate hat situation that I have going on here that I would totally wear to Ascot where I going. Uh, but nobody's going because there's a pandemic. Um, just want to mention, so I'm able, like I, uh, uh, I've been trying to run this stream through Streamlabs OBS for the past two weeks and I have failed because there's always been some sort of connectivity issue or I clicked the wrong button and my camera output was not going to YouTube or my microphone output was not going to YouTube. And I've finally gotten it set up, which from what I can, oh, I just spilled my, you can't see it, but I just spilled my, my steel pins all over my work table here but um, you can't see it, so I'm just going to clean it up here while I continue to talk. <laughs> um, but 
Oh, I lost my train of thought. I think I was talking about maybe Ascot, maybe, eh, I don't know. I, I jammed myself up with this uh, disaster here. And, you know, let me just make it so that a couple of pins will not fall over again. Um, so I think I'm going to start stabilizing. Oh, I know what I was talking about. I was talking about Streamlabs OBS, um, which is actually like, now that it's working, I really love it as a software interface for the stream because I can see you got like, you're chatting for me right here in a window that's going along the side of my screen. I've got a little window where I can monitor my video output. Um, and I also was able to add this feature right here, which this is a tip jar. So, you know, I don't expect to get paid for this. I'm doing it just really for the good of my graduate students and anybody who's interested in hanging out on studio time um, on my open studio stream. But if you want to leave a little gratuity, then if you click on this thing, you'll be able to connect to, it connects to my PayPal. So whatever. Um, but that that's not what I really love. I mean, that's just like a convenience thing. But um, what I really love about Streamlabs is it, it runs the chat in real time. There's a little bit of a delay between what you type and when I read it because it has to go through the intertubes and get here. Um, but I can see this chat and I'm able to increase the, the size of the text to the point that I can actually read what you're saying as you're saying it instead of having to get up here and squint at my, um, at my screen as I was doing the past two weeks. So that feels like a victory. Um, and, and I'm really glad to have finally gotten Streamlabs working for me. Um, this is my collection of threads that correspond to this hat right here. And some, well, let me put these clips. I have all these kinds of clips. I've, I've just started a clip collection here in my home studio. Like normally all of this stuff is just in residence at Playmakers in my shop there. And any time I needed something for a home studio project, I would just bring home my container of, for example, alligator clips. Um, and it's been difficult because that stuff all needs to stay there for my students to access it this semester while they're making hats and learning for the very first time how to make hats. And so I've had to, to buy duplicates and, and set things up here. Um, so I was keeping my thread for this project in that alligator clip bin. And then I have my thread for the Tim Burton project in you, you guys know what these kinds of clips are? Can you see that? There's some special name for these, and Denise used it recently, and I was like, that's what those are called. I need some, and I bought, like, a pack of 100. Um, they, might be, they might be superior to alligator clips. I like the alligator clips a lot when I'm working with um, wire and buckram. I really like these because they have little teeth on them and they're meant to grip onto wires. Um, but I don't so much like those alligator teeth, those alligator clips for something like positioning wire, wonder clips, that's what they're called. Yes, um, you can buy them by the hundred pack or even more, but I felt like that was overboard getting more than like 500. I was like, oh, I don't need that. Um, but I think I like these wonder clips for um, applications like turning over a, a folded edge on a felt hat, maybe around a wire, maybe just folding it back on itself. Um, because exactly what did I do without them? Um, well, what I did without them with these alligator clips was I would um, create little like like a washer, you know, I would create a little pad of usually vegetable tanned leather. I'd clip a little square of it and stick it in there so my teeth of my alligator clip didn't bite into and leave marks on my felt or my straw or the fabric if it was like a, a like this satin ribbon or something. Um, and, and that worked, but that was clearly like a, a MacGyver type of deal. 
And I really love that with the Wonder Clips that you don't need that. And they don't leave a scar, or at least so far, they haven't left a scar on anything for me. Um, but I was going to start securing this trim onto this hat. And I think I want to start up here at the top and progress down this spiral um, because I worry that the trim is going to walk a little bit as I secure it and that I'll then wind up with a weird bubble up here where, you know, it's supposed to be the focal part of my hat. Whereas if I stitch from here down and, and it walks a little bit, I'm just inserting it into the sweatband here so I can just tuck more of it up under there. Oh, I had my button fall off. Ooh, I had my, my quilt pen fell into this bin down here. I will find it later. <laughs> so I want to be um, stitching all of this stuff on up here today, or at least I'm gonna start that. Um, me too. Check that my thread is not. Mm, I don't love that. I'm more of a fan. All oh, that gray is good, especially for the pom poms. So we'll start with that. So I think on my first stream, I had a little bit of neuroses about licking my thread to, you know, that, that that was unsanitary or whatever, to lick my thread, to then thread a needle. And you may or may not have noticed, but um, because it was my very first stream, my partner Chris attended, even though he could care less about millinery work, um, and heard me say that. And he came up with a solution for how to moisten your thread meant to bring a trash can in here because I don't normally have one in here. I've got three in the other room, which I mostly am working. I'm not going to use, I'm not going to spit on it. I'm going to show you this cool thing that, that Chris gave me, which is um, sort quick fingertip moistener, <laughs> which is like one of those things that's like, why does that even exist? But it does exist. Um, who knew? And it's a thing that you can then, um, use it to make oh, it worked great um to sleek down your thread before you pass it through the eye of a needle um and that i thought was a kind of a nice innovation <laughs> so high five to chris for the easy clean way to get a better grip hygienic long lasting <laughs> So I now have three of these in various places around my studio, and I'm, I'm testing out how I feel about them as opposed to licking something. Um, see, Kim says in the chat, I use scrap felt to prevent scarring when I need a strong clip. Um, yes, they really are toothy, and I've certainly found myself in a position where... Um, I personally haven't found myself in this position in quite a while, but I, I've certainly had students um, not realize that those teeth are going to leave scars behind until it was too late, and they then spend a lot of time with some steam and a toothbrush time trying to pick that felt texture back up, um, which is you know not the ideal way to spend your time if you're making a hat. So. I'm now, see, this is, I never really, like, I've had bad eyesight my whole entire life, um, but it's really only since I've begun these live streams that I felt particularly handicapped by it, um, because I, I realized that in the nature of the stream, I want to be able to see stuff up close, but I also want to be able to look far away and read what you're seeing, what you're saying in the chat there. Um, and and I can't 
do both. Um, but what I want to do right now is secure these pom-poms on here and this little bit of ribbon through. So hopefully that's what we're going to do. Um, Kim, you have an open studio coming up, um, if I'm not mistaken, where it's uh, Orange County Open Studios, I believe, and um, they're doing it virtual this or, or via Zoom, maybe, or by appointment, is it? Um, if you uh, want to mention the details on that in the chat, I would love to know it, and, and I may not be the only person here who would love to know it. Um, Certainly, I think some of my students would be interested. I attended, so that's a, a, an event, I guess, that happens. Let me take this out of here. That's an event that happens, the Open Studio, Orange County Artists Open Studios event is, is something that happens at least once a year, might be more frequently. Um, we'll see if, if Kim is able to share some information about it in the chat. Um, I attended last fall, perhaps, um, at some point. It was lovely to, to go visit all these wonderful conversations with hors d'oeuvres and, you know, hats all around and everybody that comes by trying on hats. It was just a lovely event the last time. Um, and even though it won't be the same time, same way this time due to the pandemic, um, I look forward to attending via Zoom. That was really a fun time. Um, and it was great to see your studio space um, and your new home and all of that. Um, but I, I, I loved talking with all of the other people attending, um, you know, most of them were just uh, random people in Orange County and surrounding areas who were interested to see what a millinery studio even looked like. Um, but I was happy to be able to answer questions of folks that, you know, Kim can't talk to everybody. Um, and there was a, a, a rush at one point and I was glad to, to be there as a person who also knows about hats and could <laughs> say things about like, oh yes, that's, that's made out of a special type of felt that is specifically for hat making and so forth. Um, so I've got my pom-pom stitched on now. Do you think, okay, this is kind of crass and I apologize, but you see those, there's two of them. You don't think they're too reminiscent of like balls, do you? Because I, I think, or, you know, is it, is it crass that there's two? I think, well, once this is coming out of the bottom of them, it's more like they're, you know, festive medals or something, right? Instead of being so um, silly. Anyway, I'm digressing. That was super inappropriate, but it it occurred to me after I'd already created them and put this stuff here. Maybe that's maybe that's dirty. Anyway, um, now I wanna want to fit this little ribbon ornament up under there. Oh, I have to I have to negotiate a better way to sit for this. Uh, right now I have a, a stack of an armchair cushion that I'm sitting on. Um, but I keep sliding off of it and what I really need is like a stool of the appropriate height, which I, I think I have one downstairs actually, but um, I'll bring it up here before the next. Maybe I should, maybe I should stabilize this as an ornament because right now it's, it's pinned together into this little configuration. Um, and I was going to just leave that pin in there, but then how am I going to get the pin out because it, it's tucked up under there. And I think I want to stabilize this um, as a unit before I try to stick it up under my little pom-poms. Um, because hmm, I'm glad to hear that you guys don't think that they look too anthropomorphic. I've, I never know like whether it's just me being a 12 year old boy or whether it's like, no, that really looks like something dirty. Um, 
But I'm, I'm glad to know that it's just me being a 12-year-old boy, and it does not remind you of that. Um, so, since I have now decided to, to stabilize that ribbon ornament as a unit before I go on to the rest of this, I'm going to tie my thread off. I put these pom-poms on one other hat once before. Um, and I feel like I had come up with some strategy that time to keep from catching them in the, keep catching the, the uh, fibers in, of the pom-pom in the loop of the thread that was stitching it down so that I didn't have to keep, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm focusing on minutia and that's counterproductive perhaps. Now I have to be able to see to tie this off. I had a lovely uh, message on Instagram from the, um, I think he's the CEO, the guy who's running uh, M&S Schmalberg Fabric Flowers now, um, sent me a really kind message because I had mentioned them in some Instagram post and, and tagged their corporate account. And um, he sent me a little message saying thanks and, you know, thanks for the publicity on the blog and the, um, and I mentioned this YouTube channel and I was like, I'm totally happy to plug you there too because um, your stuff is beautiful and so much is going out of business in the garment district that we need to support everyone we can. Um, and that was just a nice little random interaction as a, cor a, a side effect of social media. Like I, I feel like I often focus on how, um, how social media can be harmful and I don't place enough focus on how it can also connect us in ways that we otherwise wouldn't even interact. And, um, so I'm trying to be more positive in thinking about social media and, and how I interact on there and, and what it brings me in the way of positive um, interactions. I need my sort quick fingertip moistener. And you know, I'm just gonna leave this open because it's clear that I'm gonna need to thread a lot of needles here because I'm switching colors to switch to the, oh my God, my eyes are so bad. Um, oh, speaking of my eyesight, you know, because I, I have now on more than one stream talked about the fact that I have glaucoma and I had this crazy eye surgery, I guess it's been about six weeks ago now. Um, I had my follow-up from that yesterday where I had to go back to that eye doctor and you know they test the pressure in my eyes and it was a first chance to see whether that I'm failing at this hmm. oh there we go um, it was a, 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 a follow-up appointment to see whether it seemed like that um, laser surgery for glaucoma had had any positive effect. Um, and I guess like they, they can't, it, it doesn't take immediate effect. They have to let, let you recover from it for six weeks before they test it out and see how it went. Um, and this is all a very long story that ends up with me going to the eye doctor yesterday. And my eye pressure was down by like, like it had been six points over ideal pressure and it was now down eight points to be in the normal uh, actually healthy good range so that was very exciting um, to know that that freaky eye surgery experience had a positive uh, result i see that we have in the chat uh, denise saying you can also use a damp sponge or a piece of foam in a jar lid to moisten your thread. That is an excellent suggestion as well. I, 
this is like a novelty thing that I think, you know, it's, it's sweet that he bought that for me, but I would not suggest that my graduate students need to track it down. Um, you know, that Denise is correct. You can just put a wet sponge in a dish. <laughs> and I was going to stabilize my little ribbon ornament here. Um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm really glad to be um, working on these hats for these two local nonprofit initiatives. I had been, in thinking about conceptually about this stream, back when I first thought about doing it, and I signed up for that uh, Streaming for Artists boot camp workshop that was fantastic, um, I had been thinking that I would wind up doing something like taking hats from the Playmakers costume stock and retrimming them or, you know, refurbishing old smushed fedoras or, or whatever. Um, it hadn't, I, I didn't have, a, I didn't have a reason to be making hats. So I was just thinking about it in terms of like, well, what, what sort of millinery could I do that would be um, beneficial for the theater in the long term, um, which was fine, and it, it was going to serve this purpose, the, the purpose of hosting an open studio stream and just sitting here working um, while other milliners and, and students and, and random community members drop by. Um, but when these opportunities came up to make hats for to help benefit other local nonprofits who are similarly well i guess the ch the classical ch station is not um is not challenged by the pandemic in the ways that the rest of us are in as much that they're a radio station and they have been broadcasting online as a live stream for years um so it's you know it's it's down to them having to coordinate internal it's probably a pain in the butt of how do you hand off one DJ to another or something, but you know, it's, they're not struck by it the way that Crate Myrtle Festival is. They have had their entire main fundraiser be impacted by the pandemic. So I have now stabilized this little bit of fru here and I'm going to tuck it up under my couture pom poms and tack it down. Um, so, you know, maybe at some point I will figure out how to add an aerial view camera so I could, you know, switch perspective from your watching me here uh, to you are watching me work. That's like a level of, of technology and equipment that I just don't really possess yet. Um, it's a dream, I guess. Uh, and thank you for the well wishes about my um, my surgery outcome and my eyesight. Um, I realize that I probably will eventually be too blind to hand sew anymore. Um, but hopefully the pandemic will be over by then and I can just make my assistants thread needles for me. Um, that's what Judy always did uh, before she retired is get people to thread up her sewing machine for her and stuff. Um, and, you know, that's how we help each other out, right? I see that in the chat, Denise says, I'm thinking about signing up for that boot camp. Well, let me talk about it here a little bit. And Mickey, if you're in the chat, please feel free to chime in. She wasn't sure. That's the woman who's leading those workshops. And she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to make it to today's stream or not. Um, and I, I can see that there are multiple viewers in the chat, but they don't tell me who you guys are. Like, I know Kim is here and Denise is here because you guys have spoken in the chat. Um, but I don't know who else might be just lurking. Um, so, Mickey, if you are one of these uh, attendees, please feel free to chime in. Um, but I would recommend, I, 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 had, I got so much good information out of that boot camp and... Um, so it was a four, it is a four week class and she talks about all the different platforms you can stream on and the pros and cons of, you know, what, what is the difference between if you're stream on IG, Instagram television 
IGTV, Facebook Live, uh, Instagram, uh, I already said Instagram, YouTube Live, Twitch, um, and, and a couple of other platforms that, that she talks about. What's the difference between them? How, what do you need to do to monet, if you can monetize them, what do you need to do to do that? Is that important to you or not? Um, and, and it was really helpful to um, not just think about it from the perspective of my own artistic practice, but the other members of the class. Like there was a woman who's a video game designer um, and a, a sketch artist, an illustrator, and a woman who is a singer-songwriter. Um, the, um, oh, I can't remember her job title per se, but she runs the Women's Theater Festival, which streamed all online this year. Um, and I found it really valuable to hear um, why they were choosing the platforms that they were choosing um, in terms of the, the strictures of their own art and, and how they felt it was best served by uh, various streaming services. And I chose to go with YouTube um, because it is, it's not, it, at present, it's not a huge priority to me to make money off of this. Um, I mean, in the fullness of time, like, I'm, I think I'm, I need 500, uh, I need, I need a thousand total subscribers and 40,000 watch hours before I could monetize this YouTube channel and this stream. Um, but, you know, I'm still in, right now, I'm still employed by Playmakers Repertory Company and UNC Chapel Hill. So, I'm doing this as a sort of a, a, a community um, effort of outreach and not because it's what I need to do to make a living. And, um, but she talked about how if, if, if your income has dried up and doing your art, you're trying to find a new way to make money doing your art, that Twitch was a better platform because um, it's easier to monetize. And you know she talks about what the different hardware and software you might need um, troubleshoots how to use this uh, Streamlab software that I'm using right now, um, which, I mean, we're, at least speaking directly to Denise, you and I, are theatrical milliners. Like, we are used to figuring things out on the fly and making sure that by the time it has to go on stage, it's going to work and learning new skills as we have to use those skills to make the thing that then functions. So I know that if I hadn't taken the Streamlab boot camp, I would have still launched this stream that I think I would have had a steeper learning curve in, I, I would be streaming just straight off of YouTube without Streamlabs software. And, um, I think I, I appreciated her technical support and her moderation of this channel or the stream, my first two streams, um, to just know that there was somebody that's like, ah, this is screwing up. Why? Okay. Here's troubleshooting. You know, that, that, it's like having a stage manager <laughs> for your stream. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, a, that's a, a long and, and wordy way of saying um, that if you're thinking about taking that class, um, I highly recommend it, not because, I mean, you're currently, six, Denise, Denise Wallace here in our chat, currently streams from her own millinery studio live every Friday afternoon for Friend Friday Millinery on a Facebook Live, which I try to drop into every time that I am available to do so. Um, and I'm hoping to come by tomorrow. I, just, I, was, I had an interview um, scheduled and they just had to reschedule because of, you know, the pandemic screws up everything. Um, so I'm hoping that I'll be able to pop in tomorrow for Fun Friday Millinery at DWS Studio on Facebook Live. Um, so, like, I realize that you are already streaming that way, but I think that um, there's still plenty to learn from this workshop um, in terms of the mechanics of other uh, software and platform options and also just really um, crystallizing what's the point of your stream who your audience, what, what your audiences are or who your audiences might be. Um, and 
to 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 have community with other artists who are also looking at this as a medium for how to deliver their artwork and i think the thing the thing that was really an aha moment for me with respect to that stream um or, or i'm sorry with respect to that workshop and i I have a, a phone call happening, but it's I'm not answering it. Um, because, oh wait, my stream is like ending in three minutes, and I think that, oh, it's my real estate agent trying to come by, and I, I really have to text her my address right now, um, because I've sold my townhouse, but it, I put it on the market, and it sold pretty much immediately, and then that person pulled out, and then I had another uh, buyer, and, and that person seems to be going ahead. So um, anyway, she's trying to come by and drop off the due diligence money, and I'm in a live stream, so um, I missed her text saying, what's your address? <laughs> Which, of course, she's been here before, but, you know... Pandemic times. I can't criticize anybody for being um, muddle-headed about anything right now. Um, so in the course of this, I have managed to, like, my stream ends in two minutes. And um, I've managed to secure my couture pom-pom ornament co cockade-esque stuff on the top of this. And begun to secure this beautiful Schmalberg fabric flower on the front. Um, that's one thing I've discovered, like streaming ma makes your productivity go because, because you're, you're, you're conversing with your, your viewers, um, and interacting with the chat, but it's kind of like, um, how when you work in a crowded studio and there's a lot of conversation among the costumers, you get far less done than when you show up at like 7 a.m. and nobody's in the shop and you can just bust stuff out. So I always overestimate my own productivity. I thought I might finish the trim on this hat and actually move on to trimming out that other one, which, ha ha, that's not happening. Um, but I, I am pleased to have made some progress on it. And um, I'm looking forward to this being finished so that I don't really know when the Cape, Crepe Myrtle Festival folks are looking to uh, receive these. I know that on my art exhibit, the Tim Burton pirate hat, the deadline on that is coincidentally Halloween. Um, so I feel like I want to finish these for Crepe Myrtle first, just because I don't know how long I have. Like I might get a text from them and be like, can we pick those hats up the next weekend? And you know, want to be able to say, yes, you can. Um, so it's four o'clock. That is the end of the scheduled studio stream. Thank you all for showing up. It's been really great to have uh, an audience again visiting in my studio another week. I will do this every Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern time. And I'm working on whatever hats um, I happen to have in the studio. And in future, you know, I, it might not be hats. I might be making a pair of gloves or a parasol. Well, I, it would be hard pressed to work on a parasol in this context. I'd have to move into the other room just to get enough um, distance on the camera and the object just because parasols are way bigger than hats, which are just head sized. Um, but anyway, thanks so much for coming. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have enjoyed this. I put out videos every Monday with um, costume construction content. Right now, that's very heavily based in millinery techniques and tips and tricks because I'm teaching millinery this semester. But in the spring, I'm going to be teaching dyeing and surface design, so I expect the predominant amount of content on the, download, the um, videos that are not streams will shift to that. And I also have fun stuff like my unboxing series. So uh, where I open hat boxes that I've gotten out of storage, I have no idea what's in them. I need to film another one of those this week for, um, that's what I'm hoping to offer for my Monday content this coming week. Um, so thank you so much for um, coming to my open studio and spending this time working on hats.